Eduardo Vega, it's so good to see you again. Last time that I saw you was just a couple of months ago in Provence in the south of France in a small village. And there you were on a motorcycle. That's right. That was uh that was one bucket list thing off of the list, man. Like I mean you your your bucket list is 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 so long. I mean you're you're the one of the world's great adventurers. <laughs> Well, I do have a new one to tell you about, but I, maybe I should do that some other time. <laughs> well, well, we, want, we want to hear about it, Eduardo. So, John, we we actually wanted Eduardo to be in the crisis summit, but we looked out the window as he rode by on the motorcycle. Oh, and... uh, yeah, he was just waving. So I got places to go. I got a bucket list to take care of. Yeah. No, I'm uh, I'm doing pilot training, so I'm going to be uh, flying out your way, David. So well, I'm, I'm looking excited. forward to jumping in the uh, the uh, plane with you, Eduardo. So uh, speaking right. of places to go, let's get this show on the road. Well, let's do it. Welcome aboard Lifelines with David and John, your guide to charting the transformative course of crisis intervention and the game-changing 9 at 8 Lifeline. So, hey there. Welcome back to... Lifelines, the 988 podcast with John and David. And every week we're bringing you the history and legacy of crisis care and pointing to the future of an environment where care feels like caring to the individual calling 988 or seeing mobile crisis or, or landing up in a, in a crisis facility. And we've got a dear friend and longtime uh, pioneer and thought leader in this space that we're so excited about being with today. Uh, John Draper, tell us about uh, our guest uh, on the Happy. podcast, episode 24. Happy to do so. David Eduardo is the CEO of Humanovations, which is transforming businesses and healthcare systems through a variety of innovative, peer-driven mental health and suicide prevention programs. And Eduardo has been a transformative leader, a major influencer, and a spokesperson for peer-driven programs and lived experience voices in suicide prevention for over three decades, advising federal, national, and local leaders in the United States and several countries across the world. It would take all day to list as many appointments and accomplishments, but my, my most dear Eduardo role was his enduring voice as an influencer to SAMHSA, the Lifeline Network, and me in his roles as the founding chair of Lifeline's Consumer Survivor Subcommittee and Lifeline Steering Committee member for 17 years. And I just couldn't be more delighted to be here today with our great friend and accomplice, Eduardo Vega. Welcome, Eduardo. Oh, it's great to see you both, and uh, I'm glad for the, for the subricate of accomplice. Um, I think, <laughs> yes, um, we, we've, we've, okay, uh, tried yeah, to yeah. bend the rules. I like to think about it, our work as sort of bending the curve in a certain sense. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Well, we're, we we're going to get in, I don't know. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to get into your assessment of how that bending of the curve is working. Uh, for those of you in our audience, uh, the picture on the right is Eduardo speaking in one of the several events that the three of us had the privilege of being at the White House, uh, thanks to our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Richard McKeon. But uh, we're glad you're with us. Uh, watch us on YouTube, like and subscribe, or wherever you get your podcasts. But today, we're going to jump in uh, with a real change maker, a uh, curve bender in Eduardo Vega. Uh, and John, we're coming uh, to this group from the heart of Atlanta, and our sponsor is Behavioral Health Link. Uh, John, you're a part of that BHL team, I am bringing indeed. that software uh, to the to the country. Yeah, and well, you know, Eduardo has been a pioneer in this "nothing about us without us" mantra to include the voices of people with lived expertise in developing suicide prevention policies, programs, and practices. But this principle guide guides us in our technology development at BHL as well as lived expertise has shaped our BHL platform's state of the industry call center module, David. We, you know, we, we know that every crisis line call is about the relationship between the counselor and the caller and technology should, should it best reinforce and at least not distract from that listening supportive connection. So we gained essential inputs from both our counselors and prominent certified peer specialists in developing our 988 ready software, making sure that 
It provided person-centered tips and caring reminders to counselors while making required data gathering efforts seamless and non-intrusive. So to learn more about how lived and studied expertise is built into the DNA of the BHL call center platform, just check us out at behavioralhealthlink.com. David? Uh, John, that uh, change-making, uh, peer, peer-powered approach that you're talking about, it, it, that's really come in large part, as you mentioned, from from Eduardo and John, your work as well. And so thrilled to have Eduardo here. Now we know a fair amount about Eduardo. You and I have traveled the world oh, with Eduardo. So we have a leg up on our first segment, which is what is Eduardo a super fan of? Now before the show, Eduardo, I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I went to my first live in-person UFC event over the weekend in Vegas. Uh, John asked me if it may be more or less of a super fan. John, what are you a super fan of? You well, want to talk I mean, about just this last weekend? I, I was in Asbury Park uh, seeing a beach concert with Bruce Springsteen, and a reminder of what a longtime super fan I've been of that man and his work. So, John, we need a blank. You got a blank piece of paper, John? I do. Yeah. Okay. So let's. Blank, uh, blank. John, John and I are going to take a shot at what you're a super fan of, Eduardo. We ought to at least both be in the ballpark, but you well, you need to tell us who's the winner. If if one of us is close enough. All right, John, you ready? Yeah, this is tough. I mean, there's just, there's so many things that this man loves and enjoys doing when I've loved enjoying with him. I'm done. Uh, but something I haven't enjoyed with him that I know he's a recent, maybe longer term super fan of, is uh, this. Home cooking. All right, Eduardo, is that warm, cold? Uh <clears throat> Well, I, I do can I am a, a cook, master um, chef. I'm not I'm not a trained chef, but I do love cook. I hadn't thought of myself as a super fan because I don't like, you know, follow the the, the chefs and do yeah. the uh, you know, obsess about recipe books and stuff like that. Um, but what? I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely in the mix. So what's your what's your go to dish? Eduardo? Uh, my sort of like classic winner is a pollo criollo. It's a um, Dominican style um, dish we call pollo guisao um, uh, with my own kind of variations on it. It's a stewed uh, chicken dish typically made with um, uh, Caribbean spices and stuff like that. And the spice level on it, Eduardo? No, it's very low. It's, okay. it's, uh, uh, so cool. this level is it. Um, I also do have like uh, cocoa van from some and some. Uh, and if I'm trying to really uh, kind of knock a date out of the park, I'll make uh, bouillabaisse, like a French seafood stew. It's it's so ironic, John. Those are the exact three items that were available at the local restaurant when I was growing up in the South. Those three uh-huh. plus plus chicken yeah, fried steak. All Southern cooking. We had chicken sure. fried steak. We had pizza. Oh, for the South, I think so. Yeah. For right. yours, Eduardo, I'm going to say you're a super fan of the arts. Mm. Isn't it amazing how how David just did that in seconds? As you know, but. Eduardo, how do how do I do? Is that pretty I close? I think that's that's probably that's, that's probably I, that's like kind of a broad category, but I'd say that's probably that's true. very broad. So, I mean, John, I I took true. this picture from a photo, actually a short video that Eduardo has on his Facebook page. Eduardo, I wasn't aware of the octopus in its own ink. Mm-hmm. Tell us about this production that you did, and uh, sounds like you've been working on that for years. Yeah, so as you know, I'm an uh, author, I'm a playwright, and theater director, um, and so I started writing Octopus on its own ink, um, like short about twenty plus it was twenty plus years ago, about twenty years ago, I guess. Um, and a lot of it was an attempt to sort of encapsulate, depict some of the experiences of my father and his uh, brothers and his generation in the Dominican Republic 
under the the sort of thumb of the dictatorship. Yeah. Octopus in its own ink is based you know, pretty loosely, um, but it is grounded in in fact uh, around uh, my father's family. Uh, his father was close to power at one point, um, and then he and his brothers, one of his brothers was uh, were uh, dissidents, and they became, they were arrested and tortured um, and put in uh, prison by the dictator. Um, in the years uh, pretty close to the time that uh, the dictator Trujillo uh, was assassinated. So Octopus in his own ink um, takes the form of a kind of a classic structure around a couple of days in which uh, the boys and their friends are trying to plot um, a, a terrorist action, as it would be called now, but a resistance a guerrilla, a guerrilla action. Holy smoke, um, Eduardo. Uh, meanwhile, the father is preparing to have a dinner with uh, El Jefe, the, the leader, um, at home, and everything comes together in uh, the mix of this uh, intense meal and afterwards in which octopus in his own name is served. Oh, that's the dish as well. Oh, my goodness. And that's also what Eduardo likes to prepare at home. We didn't mention that, David. This octopus <laughs> in its own ink is delicious. Well, John, uh, Eduardo's activism and advocacy that you and I have had the privilege of, of being a part of and watching over the years uh, gives more context. So, Eduardo, you actually had this play run a, uh, a short series or it went one time. How, how often did it, uh, did it go and what was that like putting that together? Um, well, yeah, so we had a, a successful workshop production last year in Hollywood here at the uh, Fringe Festival, a really great uh, cast and uh, really well received. And the next step is a uh, Broadway production, not Broadway, but a New York production. Uh, it could be on Broadway. A lot of people don't know there's a lot of small theaters on Broadway, yeah, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, and what, um, uh, Eduardo, to, did you cast somebody who was particularly handsome in your role? Um, I don't have a featured role, but uh, yes, the, the lead, which would have been my grandfather, was a, a pretty charming, good-looking fellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Eduardo, that brings us to the good news section. And today I want to highlight a couple of books that have just come out uh, literally in the last couple of weeks. But before we do that, let's lay some groundwork by going through some of the key works that have shaped this lived experience, people coming out about their own suicide attempts. Eduardo, as I put these books up, uh, let's get a quick comment from you, a word or two or more about your, uh, was this uh, important to you and or the world in uh, shaping some of our uh, dialogue around lived experience? Uh, the first is William Styron's A Darkness Visible, published in 1990. Yeah, I think that was uh, that was very significant. Um, it uh, affected me personally, um, and uh, because also I'm a poet and I was a fan of William Styron's, um, and it's a, you know it's beautifully written. So I think where that really helps kind of take things to the next level is, you know, in a certain sense, you know, shining light into the darkness so that people can see what it's like. He he talks, you know, in you know, very lyrical language. He's a great poet, great writer, uh, but also um, without like kind of pulling any punches about sort of the, what it's like to, to live in kind of the different phases of this uh, kind of overwhelming depression and, and despair. And it's, um, uh, you know, and, and ultimately you kind of go on the journey with him to some degree uh, in a way that's, I think, very compelling. And I think part of the success of the book uh, is just that there was so little out there where people, you know, actually you know, described, you know, all of the, the pain and struggle 
um, and in detail when it yeah. comes to you know, a major depressive episode. Would we would we be where we are today without this book, Eduardo? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, he he definitely talks about suicide intensity here and there. Um, I think this book, you know, probably was a major advance in the in the level of popular knowledge related to things like despair and depression and, and suicide. So I'd say probably we would not. Uh, be there. I don't know if some of the other books we're going to talk about would have even kind of come come forward because publishers were pretty surprised by how successful the book was. Right, right. Uh, Heidi Bryan's uh, "Now What Do I Do?" Surviving a Suicide Attempt from 2003, and uh, we we all all of us obviously know Heidi. I was so glad for this. Um, book and also that you know her uh her personality really comes through in terms of like she has this great capacity to be very direct um and unflinching but also you know warm and compassionate and in in heidi's approach to things i always see this kind of spirit of humility and self-compassion uh which a lot of times you know is is a hard thing uh because when you're struggling with suicide in intensity um it's easy to be in a frame of a lot of judgment part of it might be self-judgment um and other things are kind of related to social judgment that we kind of internalize around um yeah. our experiences so she, i think she does a great job of you know very it, simply it, describing some of that Eduardo, in this list of books about uh, lived experience and, and talking about your, your own life, uh, I do include Why People Die by Suicide by Thomas Joyner. It, for me, it was one of the sort of setting the stage for all this, but I don't, maybe maybe it doesn't belong in this group. What, what What's your thought on that? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, Thomas has been very you know public about his father's suicide, but it isn't really a part of this book. Um, and, you know, it's, it's useful, I think for, you know, the world to know, to understand that, you know, part of his, you know, scientific quest or, you know, or his, his personal, um, his personal passion for exploring and understanding suicide more came from this, his lived experience, um, and that that actually you know makes it very significant in the sense that uh, although you know a fair amount of the book is framed in some clinical and scientific terms, like you know that there is a there's a heart um, and a head working together uh, in the way that he he has reconfigured the experience of suffering um, and the uh, and connected that to capability, et cetera, when it comes to, you know, people who actually do make attempts and die. So I, we have a number of uh, more of these, Eduardo. Let's just get one word as we go through these. Uh, the next one is Eight Stories Up from De Quincey Lazine. Beautiful. Uh, Real Men Do Cry, Eric Kippel. That's not one I've, not, I've read, I have to say. You know, Eric spoke at the Nash, at the American Association of Suicidology Conference. Um, it might have been 14. It was that year that they started to really put lived experience on the stage. Yeah, no, I, I remember him talking, but I haven't read, read the book. But uh, I, uh, I mean, what, I think that it, it is a, it's a, it's an important uh, message and all the stuff related to both the internal and then, you know, the internal experience of masculinity. Right. And our sort of social codes around it in terms of, you know, both culture, but also, um, you know, the ability to uh, 
to be honest and how that's um you know how that's squelched so often okay yeah Silouan, uh, he's the star of our film. I actually wasn't aware he had published a book until I was putting this list together, and I wanted to make sure he hadn't published a book, but he did back in 2012. Were you aware of that one, John? Which one again, David? Who Am I by Silouan Green? You know, I was not, um, but I I'm, I was just remembering uh, one that I that you may have skipked in here, but, uh, you know, K, K. Redfield Jameson's Unquiet Mind was... Hugely influential to, to, I know, De Quincey. Uh, De Quincey said that really um, moved him to start talking about his experience. What what year do you think that right. came out, and right? Night, and Night Falls Fast, both of them, um, yeah. you know, she does incorporate her personal um, lived experience. It, yeah, it was more, like, more, in the, more in the other one, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Great. I'm going to add those to the list. Of course, Kevin Hines, Crack Not Broken in 2013, Eduardo. Yeah. I still have to get that guy to sign my copy. I have a copy. I don't have him sign it. But uh, no, uh, Kevin continues to like uh, just inspire. And I love his, um, the, you know, the way the book is written, really. You know, even though, you know, obviously there were other people like working on the, uh, on the language and this sort of, it really comes out as his story, yeah. um, and, and with his with his heart and spirit. So. Uh, John, I'll look to you. One word for Terry Wise uh, waking up. Mm -hmm. I thought it was groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I mean, in her her life before and after. Did and she change the title? Was it re-released under a different title? Wasn't it Waking Up Alive? What's the What's this title here? This so, one says Waking Up. Uh, this is so maybe it was originally Waking Up Alive, Eduardo? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think that, that may be right, Eduardo. That does sound right. Mm -hmm. And and have either one of you, I wasn't aware that Josh Rivadal had, had, uh, had written a book, but he was part of our Zero Suicide Summit in 2015. Yeah. No, I wasn't aware of that either. And then uh, Kevin Briggs, uh, he does talk a little bit about his own personal experience, but he, he also writes a lot about Kevin Berthea. Uh, one word on that book, uh, Eduardo. Uh, I, I haven't read the book, but I know the, the, the people involved, and I think it's, it's a beautiful story of how they, you know, later on came together to um, tell, you know, make this very intense story you know, human and use their shared experience and their um, intersecting experience uh, with Kevin's suicide attempt um, as this powerful advocacy point. Um, and that also, you know, having, you know, spent a lot of time on the bridge myself um, and seen, you know, so many immediate aftermaths of suicide death off the Golden Gate Bridge that, you know, uh, the people who were working there and who were connecting, um, you know, made a tremendous, tremendous difference. It's not something that we associate with law enforcement, being uh, kind of compassionate and right. spending time talking and listening. Kevin Briggs, you know, really modeled a different approach um, to law enforcement and inter interactions when it comes to suicide, because uh, many people with lived experience, you know, have had interactions that were really pretty much driven by coercion. Um, uh, you know, whether or not you believe, you know, police intervention is is useful um, or desirable. It, it, you know, clearly some lives have been saved. Right. But the point is that I think you know. Kevin Briggs' um, compassion, his willingness to kind of be there and stay there rather than, right. um, you know, kind of constantly go to coercive methods of, you know, you know, stopping, seizing, you know, right. detaining. Staying uh, in that really moment powerful. with that person. Yeah. Craig, Craig Miller, John, his book, This Is How It Feels. Craig Miller is, talk about, uh, 
self-compassion and just compassion for suffering and an understanding of, of, of how to convey that in a way that moves everyone. And I mean, to tears, uh, Craig probably, uh, moves me to tears listening to him more than any other speaker I've heard out there. And Craig will be in our podcast next week. I'm going to run through these others. Joe Williams, who's going to be in our next film. Uh, Kalichi Ubozo, who was in the S word. Of course, Marsha Linehan, who finally came out in 2012 and then wrote a book, Building a Life Worth Living. That was such a big day, wasn't it? When we oh, were my God. It all friends since she came out. Like, I, yeah, I was like, on a plane and oh, John, you, you, mentioned, okay, yeah, okay. you mentioned weeping. I remember when I was reading the article and just tears and uh, okay. it was yeah. stunning. So powerful, Eduardo. E Eduardo, have you read When It Is Darkest yet? Uh, I haven't. No, um, no. Yeah. I mean, surprisingly, I don't spend a lot of my off time reading books about suicide prevention uh, <laughs> or about suicide experiences. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, no, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen I've seen parts of it and I've heard good things about it. Um, so it's, I had... it's always really nice to see a, a you know, a clinician researcher kind of connecting yeah. To uh, lived experience. Exactly. Um, I, I had not read it and uh, my son read it and recommended it to me. Uh, and I was stunned uh, that level of self-disclosure. Uh, another person who's going to be in our next film is Lauren Bayram, who's written this book, Tired of Living Now What? She lives in Brazil. Of course, Tanja Miles, her book, Eric Kramer's new book. And the two I wanted to, good news, John is Allie Robinson, who didn't want to be in our film because she didn't right. want to tell her story publicly, is mm -hmm. now written a book that was released two weeks ago, Running the Endless Race. David, oh, you wow. really you really that opened that up. Race. That's great. Because she, again, as you say, she wasn't really wanting to talk about it. Now, now is she in a movie, but now she's written a book. About it. Yeah. And then uh, uh, all of us, I think, know John Brogdon, a uh, former top political leader in Australia who had a very public yeah. uh, suicide uh, uh, challenge and uh, has, came out with a book just last week, Profiles in Hope, 15 Australians Tell Their Stories of Surviving Suicide and Finding the Way Back to a Better Life. I have not read this one yet, wow. but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to it. Yeah. I'm excited for that one, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm glad that you... Uh, you know, talked about Allie here too, because I think, um, you know, I, I appreciated meeting her and I loved the way that her story was integrated into the, the film. Um, and also I think that she, she speaks importantly to, um, what is really a legitimate ambivalence when it comes to talking about or identifying, um, as being a suicide temp survivor, et cetera. Um, uh, and so, you know, for a lot of people, there are, I should say, for some people, there are little to no or a certain unknown quantity of impacts that come as a result of personal disclosure. Um, for some people, there are some, there are very distinct um, and at least, and potentially harmful yeah. um impacts so uh and and then i guess beyond that there's also the issue for some of us and i think you know i think about these amazing people like kevin and and craig um and others where in you know the the sort of master identity of being associated with your worst time in life um right. you know is is problematic. Uh, we don't always want to uh, have that be what people think of us as. And you know, Ali, you know, I think really rightfully, you know, talk about um, you know her mixed her mixed feelings about about some of that because um, if you're talking about someone else who has um, uh, you know, who you've known or you've seen or you've lost to suicide. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, 
Uh, but when you talk about yourself and you, you kind of, uh, you know, craft, so to speak, a public identity around some of this lived experience, um, it can be, uh, it can feel, I think, somewhat limiting uh, is, is one way to put it. Uh, but the other thing is that and I think it's useful to talk about is that, uh, you know, we in our field tend to be somewhat blind to it, you know, because, you know, whether or not rightfully, um, you know, clinicians and mental health professionals, you know, sort of live in a world in which we experience or think about mental health conditions as, as you know, sort of everyday, explainable, acceptable, I know, um, uh, experiences that you know, through which people need to be you know supported and championed uh, but there's still a lot of places in the world and actually you know a lot of people don't know there are even laws on books in many US states um, that will actually impact your life if you are known to have been in a hospital made a suicide attempt right um, have a, a particular type of diagnosis right um, you know, Eduardo, if you might don't mind me asking, I'm wondering how, because you're an interesting case. I mean, not only are, have you always been open about your uh, suicide attempt survivorship, but also you've been uh, a leader in many ways, not only an advisor, but you, you know, head of the uh, Mental Health Association of, of, of uh, San Francisco. You were, um, you had held uh leadership position position at the self-help clearing house uh you've had a number of leadership positions um have you do you feel like um you've been in many ways uh negatively impacted by your speaking openly about your suicide attempts um it's hard to it's hard to say you know um whether the impact is sort of negative all told. Uh, but I can say that I've been differentially impacted. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I had opportunities as a result of, you know, my, my, you know, telling my own story and also advocating for others with lived experience uh, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, you know, absolutely, I feel like there are opportunities that I was maybe not overlooked at, but not like uh, considered for that, you know, based on my professional profile, I probably would have been mm -hmm. um, if, uh, you know, that identity of being a person with lived experience was not part of the mix. And, and you know, those things have changed a bit, um, certainly in the last 20 years, quite a lot. But I do want to just kind of get back to one point you made that I said you said that I was always disclosed, and that's not actually true, uh, because when I started in mental health, um, you know, and and that goes back to college. Even though I had my first social human services job was just after I had survived a suicide attempt, um, you did not talk about your own experience at all. Even in community-based services where I worked as a paraprofessional, um, it was made very clear that like. There were sick people and we were not them. Um, and, uh, you know, could you, you know, talk with coworkers, you know, when you're having drinks after work? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, but um, until, you know, the, until I started working at the clearhouse, at clearhouse and starting to connect with people who had, um, you know, who were willing to talk about not only their personal experience, but also, you know, alternatives to the traditional mental health system, um, you know, advocacy and human rights related to these issues, uh, I I did not feel empowered to to talk about um, my lived experience. Even in graduate school, I remember. Um, I know it's a little bit of a divergence, but uh, I remember that uh, one of my uh, friends who was also on the on the clinical track, you know, I I talked to him and he said, you know. I have to take up these medication, these medications, um, and he. But he was very clear, like, you know, we were friends. That was not going to be information that the professors, that any of his clinical supervisors, that any other people 
um, on our uh, internship team would know about. Yeah, um, that was on the down low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and these are, you know, and within the mental health field itself, you know, and there still is some of that. So on the other hand, I actually know, uh, I was just thinking about a friend of mine. I know a person who is uh, themselves, uh, uh, who did his, took his board exams for psychiatry while he was actually in an inpatient unit. They let him out of the inpatient unit to go take his, uh, mm -hmm. his board exams in psychiatry. So that was very interesting. So, uh, Eduardo, shifting just a little bit, building on that 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 work though, uh, you guys were referencing Unquiet Mind and Night Falls Fast. Here's another book. It's it's not specifically around uh, suicidality, but it is around some of these same issues of discrimination and shame. Uh, it's on our own by Judy Chamberlain. So mm -hmm. this is our over under for the week, John Draper. I'm writing uh, Judy. Uh, had a uh, severe emotional distress after a miscarriage when she was 21 years old. She was involuntary, involuntarily committed, and she quickly discovered how it was nearly impossible to regain her freedom. Uh, she was told she would not live outside an institution. She defied that prognosis, uh, went on to become a psychiatric user, survivor, and, ex and, and started the ex-patient movement. Uh, so what year was this published, John, on your, on, on our own? Oh, wow. Judy Chamberlain. And, and Eduardo, you're going to take the over or the under here. Uh, but this really was a groundbreaking book in the patient movement. I'm curious to know if I know the year. I think I, I think I do, but um, I'm. All right. Well, I'm let me, let me call out a guess. Um, I'm going to say 1961. 61. Eduardo. Yeah, yeah. What, Eduardo, you think you, you think you have it more nailed down or, or, or do you just want to take the over? Uh, I'd say 1974. Yeah, very close. 1977. Oh, I was going to say 78 first. Okay. I was, yeah. I, I was right first, but then I second guessed myself. Um, On our own, patient yeah. controlled alternatives to the mental health system, a scathing critique of traditional mental health treatment, still very relevant to today, today's mental health care system. And it, uh, the uh, humane alternatives, dignity, autonomy, key themes, Eduardo, I've heard from you over and over. And John, uh, this is well, a Cuckoo's slide. Nest come out or right around that time. When did that come out? Do you remember? What was that, John? When did Cuckoo's Nest come out? Oh, it had to be a similar time 75, frame. 75, 76. So that was good timing for that book to come out. Yeah. So, Eduardo, I did this slide years ago with some buttons from uh, Judy. Uh, any of these uh, resonate for you, Eduardo? <laughs> um, well, I think the question, you know, no limits on recovery. That's really important, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and I like that, you know, psychiatry is social control. You know, the... Um, there's a lot of, you know, yeah, not just even recently, but going back many years, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, critical inquiry into the role of psychiatry um, uh, and in particular, you know, it's the role that it plays with regard to, um, you know, control, coercion, um, sort of you know, other social factors. Um, but uh, but recovery, you know, there's no limits to recovery. And also, I think, you know, the recovery model is talked about a little bit less now um, and for a couple of reasons, I think. But it was so important um, and remains so with regard to certain types of conditions in particular. But the whole idea that, like, um, that Judy, you know, talked about and, you know, I received some messages as well, but I was grew up in a much different era. Um, but I was, you know, told, eh, you probably, you know, I wouldn't think too much about finishing college. You know, maybe you could work at McDonald's, this kind of thing. Like the idea that, you know, having um, a mental health, you know, challenge of a certain type meant you were, you know, permanently broken. Right. Uh, that you should expect less. People should expect less of you. 
Um, and with regard to the recovery movement that was so significant was, yeah, people like Judy and my good friend, you know, Sally and Joe Rogers, some of the early advocates, you know, they, they were there in that era where, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of bridge between, um, between, you know, individual psychotherapy, you know, that you couldn't tell anybody about, you know, seeing a shrink, you know, once a week and state hospital right. involuntary commitment. Yeah, that's right. Essentially on, ongoing with, yeah. with very little process. So, um, so the recovery movement that was so important that people, I think, don't really often process is that it really challenged psychiatry in all sorts of ways. That yeah. you know the findings, um, you know the Harding findings and stuff like that. That like, you know, just really shook up completely people's uh, preconceptions of what it meant to have a serious mental health condition. Um, John, this episode is is flying by, but as we talk about the past, it does remind me of the question you were going to ask about uh, since since you two did the way forward together. How far have we come, John? Yeah, I'm I'm curious about that, Eduardo, because you were just mentioning earlier that over the last 20 years, you feel like we have made progress. I'm curious in what ways you feel like we have made progress um, and, and even thinking about the way forward when that was published in 2014, which uh, again, for, for those of you who aren't aware, aren't aware of it, uh, Eduardo and I co-chaired a, a, a suicide attempt survivors task force uh, from the National Action Alliance of Suicide Prevention. The way forward came out of that a list of recommendations that was written up beautifully by uh, Dr. DeQuincy Lazine and in those recommendations, I'm wondering if you if you feel like we've got a long way to go, we've come pretty far, or what do you think it it should look like? What do you think we should be striving for? What would what does the proper integrated level of lived expertise look like in our profession? Uh, well, thanks for for mentioning that. And I do, uh, you know, wasn't in my earlier byline, but um, I did actually this last year also incorporate the nonprofit, the Blinds Institute. For lived experience, uh, I'm sorry, the Plants Institute for Peer Support and Lived Expertise, uh, where we're uh, really looking to take uh, and you know translate some of these findings into you know more pervasive knowledge base, you know more extensive policy and program change, et cetera. So building on some of those those things uh, at the intersection of mental health and suicide prevention. Um, the answer to your question is. Uh, we've come really far in some ways and not far enough in others. Uh, and, you know, insofar as the way forward is a cultural document, which I think it is, and I know that, but I would say I feel proud to hear people talking around the world about it from time to time and stuff like that. Um, it was very, it was very uh, monumental or seminal or whatever, um, just in saying, hey, these people have some insight. There, there is, there are alternative views. There are alternative ways that things can be done and thought. Um, and uh, the biggest change that we've seen is that you know, lived experience related to personal experience of suicide intensity, you know, has gone from something that was very much intentionally um, uh, restrained within the mental health and suicide prevention uh, sector. To something that's really actively embraced, um, and I think you know it's even become kind of a little bit trendy, so to speak, um, in a way that it wasn't before. So that is, uh, you know, an amazing change. Where I think we still have a long way to go um, is toward the implementation of those things. So as you know, with the, the recent national strategy, you know, we at Plants Institute held a, a, a sort of webinar on the national strategy that incorporates a lot of language regard to lived experience um, and lived expertise. Um, uh, but the, the technical aspect of making that real, still, still, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there are some very practical things that have changed that are very interesting. And I think um, one of the ones, as an example, I've been invited to a couple of editorial boards um, 
where they are inviting experts with lived experience um, to review academic papers. This has just started with the uh, British, uh, the PMJ, the British Medical Journal, and the Lancet in, in the UK. Uh, U.S. publications still don't really have that. Uh, as far as I know, SLTB, you know, has a way to go. Um, they've never talked to me, though I don't think they've talked to other people. But the point is, that's what you talk about expertise, right? Like, it's not just about, you know, people telling their stories and inspiring others, so that's value. It's about um, people bringing a combination of expertise to think about how are we talking about suicide? What are we doing about it? Um, and how do we make sure that um, whatever is being done, uh, whatever is being uh, talked about, it's it's done out, it's done in a frame that's person positive. It's about people on the other side of that experience, um, and that's not contributing to our legacy of, you know, you know, in, in fact, institutional discrimination, but also, um, you know, stigmatizing, demeaning, and and undignified representations of people's experience. So so um, we've come a long way and you know both of you have played a significant part in that uh, and uh, and many of our other uh, colleagues. Uh, and yet I think um, when we talk about you know expertise, that's say doing not just doing things slightly differently, but doing different things based on uh, people's lived experience, you know, thinking about um, suicide, talk, people talk about suicide care. I like to talk about crisis support, so it's like um, not just crisis care, crisis support, help, helping people get their own way through things, you know, recognizing and connecting to uh, experiences of suicide intensity, you know, as something that are, that is um, not foreign, that's not shameful, uh, but that also that people get through every day. Um, and, uh, that the people that go through it um, have very distinctive knowledge to bring to bear, um, and also, you know, resources in a certain sense to contribute um, to others. That you know, frankly, you know, clinical services, other services, no, never really gonna. Happen. And I say this because you know, sometimes you know, when I, you know, I've told my story to you guys, you're pretty familiar with it, but. Um, it's very clear to me that, you know, peer support and meeting somebody else who had recently survived a suicide attempt and had been through a lot of suicide experience, like that probably saved my life. Um, I have been in hospital. I, have, I had seen the psychiatrists. I had seen psychologists since I was a child, this sort of thing, you know. They did not give me what I needed um, uh, to feel like, you know, I could and should get through um, that, you know, suicidal uh, intensity. Um, meeting another person who I liked and respected um, uh, and who had been there did. And um, that's the part that we need to continue to re reinforce. Um, suicide is not about other people. It's about people. Wow, John. Eduardo, where do you see the major resistances right now to this work continuing to uh, drive forward? Um, well, I think, you know, anytime we talk about something that is, you know, kind of related to classic sort of stakeholder engagement, there are, you know, difficulty points when it comes to stuff like public policy and pro sort of um, on the other hand, we have really good models within health systems with things like patient advisory boards um, uh, and you know patient-centered outcomes, these sort of things. Um, so there's uh, the models and the mechanisms are there, you know. But the mental health system and um, uh, and then others, you know, I think you know continue to be, um, I guess you know, hesitant. Um, I think a lot of times people just, you know, have, don't really know sort of how to proceed, right. what would be a good way to engage people, where are the, are the touch points, you know, in a certain sense for engagement of, of lived experience. I think 
in a certain sense, you know, they are everywhere, but um, we have, you know, legacy systems that are used to functioning in a certain, uh, in a certain way. And then, you know, ultimately the other, you know, really significant issue, and it goes back to, I'm glad, really uh, glad that you brought up Judy, uh, Judy Chamberlain. So somebody that I knew I was personally inspired by, but is the recognition that in our U.S. Um, system, and in fact, in many systems around the world, um, the uh, experience of thoughts of wanting to die or suicidal intensity, suicide ideation, this sort of thing, um, is in fact an institutional um, uh, sort of gate. Uh, and uh, it is a, a mechanism through which people's um, autonomy and choice right. are taken away. Yeah. Um, and for some people, also, it is the primary access point to mental health services, certainly in the public sphere. So it's a very difficult sort of um, Chinese box that we're in, where you can't, um, many places, and when I was a counselor, I remember people would say, you know, oh, tell Mary to tell the people over at uh, San Francisco General that, you know, she wants to kill herself so that she'll get in. Right. Um, and there, are, there, and I have also been uh, with uh, friends and family members who were not suicidal enough to get uh, into the hospital that they wanted to get into. Yeah. So yeah. Um, until we really, you know, look at this, you know, um, you know, not having suicide experiences be, you know, either the portal nor the barrier to the kinds of yeah. care that people get, um, but something that's that's connected to, you know, communities and systems that care for people's mental health and personal struggles regardless. You know, until we really get there and start to take apart, tease apart um, the policies, the practices, and the programs that, that we talked about in way forward uh it, we're gonna it's gonna it's gonna feel like we're going back and i feel like it's gonna yeah. be hard to make significant sustained change yeah Ed, eduardo so much of today uh we've been talking about peer support and uh you two and sally who we've talked about have been colleagues and peers and supports to me and uh of course john somewhere along the way uh we got the moniker the rat pack uh, how, how did that happen eduardo Oh, I think uh, it was just like, you know, John's kind of smelly, like ferreting around, like uh, yeah, no, the yeah, back my, of the my, kitchen my, kind of thing. Yeah, my poor that. hygiene. But but I think it might have had to do with with uh, Sally uh, for some That'd reason. So, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Eduardo, I have a quick, as we're bringing this to uh, to a close, I have a quick trivia. Who was the original leader of the Rat Pack, uh, either John or Eduardo? Not this Rat Pack, the original Rat Pack, the real oh, one. The original, the original rat, pack. rat Pack. I kind of feel like it was Sammy Davis, but I don't know. Not Dean Martin. So uh, uh, people say Frank Sinatra became the most recognized, it but it was originally a social circle led by Humphrey Bogart. Oh, really? Uh, where did the name Rat Pack come from? I'll give you four options. A Las Vegas nightclub, a joke made by Lauren Bacall, a song title, or a movie they starred in. Ooh, that sounds like a Lauren Bacall thing. It was a Lauren Bacall I thing. Uh, one that. night, yeah. she yeah. was Bogart's wife. Yeah. She saw the group yeah. come in after a night of partying, and she said, you you guys look like a GD rat pack. Um, yeah, well, you get... You, yeah, you gave it away with the, with the Bogart thing because I didn't actually know yeah, that. But as soon as right. yeah, that makes sense. Right. Where where did they? Where was their primary gathering spot? What city? Please, Vegas. It was Vegas, of course. Uh, of course, Sammy Davis Jr. Um, Eduardo, multi talented, uh, one of the few black members of the group breaking racial barriers. Uh, which political figure was closely associated with the Rat Pack? Ronald Reagan? No, John, I was, I was too young for that. No. John F. Kennedy. 
John F. Kennedy, uh, Peter Lawford, who was married to JFK's sister, Patricia, introduced the group to the future president. And Frank Sinatra was a well-known supporter during his election campaign. Yeah, he's, he's saying he's saying high hopes, right? Which was the, high hopes. that was the theme song for the, the campaign. What what movie that was remade uh, in the last years uh, uh, came from an original Rat Pack movie that starred all five key members? Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's Eleven, John. And who was uh, known as the king of cool within the Rat Pack? Oh, that was Steve Martin, right? Dean Martin, Martin, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, who was the king of cool in our group? That was you and me, Eduardo, right? Not John. <laughs> Had to be Eduardo. <laughs> So, uh, John, that brings us to the incredibly true tales of Behavioral Health Link. Incredibly uh, true. I mean, every, every, week really we're, true. every week we're coming at you with uh, bringing up uh, the, the, the uh, going back to the vault. And, John, today I want to start. We were talking about Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Killer Mike. Uh, emerging, uh, not only a very successful uh, entertainer and rapper from Atlanta, but also an emerging political figure, visited the Behavioral Health Link call center with staff from the Lifeline in 2018. He uh, had heard about high-profile suicide deaths, wanted to make a difference. Initially, he wanted to volunteer and answer calls and provide support. Um, again, Eduardo, clinical protocols we we didn't do that but we did have a visit uh with killer mike uh and uh uh john it's uh it's amazing as these services gain more profile and they become more important to uh folks like uh you can't imagine the rat pack doing that back in the in their day but uh something that is increasingly the case today just um, thinking about Killer Mike on the phone, I mean, people wouldn't just phoned up not to be listened to, but to listen to him. I mean, why don't you just talk, Killer Mike? Cause, but this also reminds me uh, how sad it is that most call centers, many of them, uh, have a lot of virtual staff. So if Killer Mike comes by, nobody's going to see him. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Speaking well, of that, uh, Killer Mike, uh, Eduardo, did you see the video of John Bon Jovi interacting with the woman over the rail of the bridge in Nashville? John, what did you make of? of well, uh, I think I think uh, she was she was just while she was on the bridge, she was thinking about living on a prayer, and there he showed up. Yeah, was, uh, I mean, look what? if if if, yeah. if, if, if John Bon Jovi or any major star shows up on the bridge and asks you to get off, you, you're going to think it's a sign. <laughs> you know? So I, I was just, I was touched by the way he approached her. Uh, it was careful. It was thoughtful. It reminded me of a Kevin Briggs type of, he wasn't rushing in. I don't what he said, David. What, what did he uh, say? Well, we, we don't know exactly because, and the only reason we know about this at all is the city of Nashville released the video footage. Yeah. Uh, of his interaction, but it was, it seemed like, uh, it was low key. It was caring. It was engaged. He just pulled over. He was driving, saw her and no, they over. were shooting a, uh, this is a walking bridge right mm. across the Cumberland, the middle of Nashville. And he was shooting a music video. So there was, uh, there was not that very many people on the bridge. Um, uh, and, uh, he looks over and there's a woman probably 50, 60, 70 feet away who is now standing on the other side of the rail. Mm -hmm and approaches, stands away from her about 10 feet, began, just puts his arms out, starts to talk to her, and then gets closer, and uh, ultimately she comes across the rail. But I think it would be a case where you would say, I'm John Bon Jovi. You do want to make that kind of impression and engagement with that person and that interaction. Yes. yes. But, John, it's time for some plain truth. And, look, we've been doing this work together for a minute, you, me, and Eduardo. Uh, we We've seen gains, work left to do, but John, give us some plain truth. Well, my yeah, and I've, I've learned a lot from all of it, you know, since focusing my work in suicide prevention over the past 20 years, uh, there's really not much us and them in the way I think anymore. You know, before my gig at Lifeline, I spent about 20 years learning my role as a mental health aide, as a therapist, a mobile, mobile team director, a hotline director, and I learned how different I needed to be from the people I was serving to be helpful to them, but working in behavioral health and especially suicide prevention is humbling business. And if you keep your mind and heart open enough to learn something new, we 
we learned that we're all in the just trying to survive and thrive while being a good human business. My, my most poignant lessons in humility and growth have come from the many people I work with and respect immensely as mentors and advisors, people like Eduardo, people who, people like Sally, who've lost ones to suicide and persons who've experienced this. Eduardo talks about suicidal intensity. That phrase is not familiar to many. You've heard Eduardo use it here a few times, uh, but he developed the term because our efforts to include the voice of persons who had survived suicide attempts in our work didn't include those who had seriously, uh, including chronically serious, serious thoughts of suicide. So his term suicidal intensity reminds us that we must include the entire spectrum of seriously suicidal experience from thoughts to action when we are talking about preventing suicides. And he was also probably the first to remind me that the things I learned in existential philosophy classes were 100% applicable here, that having suicidal thoughts was not a terrible thing, but sometimes even a necessary thing. He would say that such thoughts could be a reminder that it was not so much realizing that your life needed to end. Rather, perhaps these thoughts were telling you that it was the way you were living your life that needed to end. And likewise, my advisors and mentors who are suicide loss survivors taught me many things about living with unimaginable suffering and making meaning of that suffering. I, I learned from them pretty quickly to stop using the phrase committed suicide as if it were a, a crime or a plan intentionally devised to hurt others. They taught me that life in the shadow of suicide loss does not ever bring satisfying answers to plaguing questions such as, why did they kill themselves? Or is there something more I could have done? Those questions never really go away. But over time, a great deal of time, they, they can, can, can potentially plague survivors with less frequency and intensity. But above all, what I learned from them is that terrible things can still happen to terrific people, even when they think they're doing most everything right. And what helps the ones I know move passionately through their life is their commitment to do everything within their power to prevent other people from suffering what they've suffered. My advisors, mentors, friends who are also lost survivors or living with or through suicidal intensity have taught me a lot about making meaning and the importance for both reasons for dying and above all reasons for living. They've taught me how out of the most complex darkness can emerge a simple light, And the rest is hard work. But as Nietzsche said, he who has a why to, to live can bear most any how. Suicide prevention work teaches lessons that are both vital professionally and personally. And the work we do and the people we're doing it with teach me about what I can do to help me and the people in my life stay safe from suicide. I haven't had any periods of suicide intensity in my life, but I'm not naive enough to think it could never happen. And we don't talk about it much, but whenever the data comes up that reminds us that most suicides in this country occur with middle-aged white males, don't think I don't think, damn, that's me. I, I know people who've died by suicide, but I have been incredibly fortunate that I have not lost any of my closest friends to suicide or my closest loved ones. While, while I've been fortunate so far, I know, I, I know I've know i got to remain vigilant and available for the people I love. When I first heard that nearly one in five adolescents think seriously about suicide, I thought, man, that, that's my daughter. And when I worked with my colleagues at the Lifeline to create the BeTheOne2.com campaign, where we provide the five best basic steps for people to help those in their lives whom they believe could be suicidal, I think about those steps all of the time when I'm interacting with the people that I care about and whenever they're going through a hard time. But what about keeping me, a middle-aged white male, safe? For me, maintaining meaningful connections with people in my life is the most important thing I can do. And, and maintaining meaning in general. A, a male colleague who lost his father to suicide advised me back in 2008 that I should get on Facebook. He suggested that it was a, a novel way to expand our social network. I tried it for a little while, and it just didn't do much for me. I, I've been in therapy a few times in my life, but each time for only a few sessions before I felt like I was getting the benefit I needed. What really makes a difference for me is the friends I've made along the way from middle school until today. But I got to say, aside from my brother and my wife, the people I'm most likely to go to when I'm having a rough time are my friends that I've made through work. The people in this line of work are truly amazing. You've heard David talk about this and 
and and I've made reference to it during the show, but my buddy Eduardo, he's he's taught me a lot about peer support just by the way he walks and talks it as a friend. Eduardo will always be one of my go-to people for peer support, as you are, David, as is Sally, and others I have the privilege of coming to know through choosing psychology and crisis services as a profession. It's a damn shame there aren't more middle-aged men in our profession. It would surely bring our national suicide rate way down. You guys are the best. I look forward to staying with y'all in this business of surviving and thriving. Uh, while, we're, while we're still trying to be good humans together. David, that's my plain truth. Oh, and that's uh, that's Beautiful. some great stuff, John. Love you. Love you, Eduardo. Sally's been such a dear nice. friend to, to us. The ups and downs, uh, the, the all four of us have been through in our lives. It's just been three years ago now that we had our second in-person get-together retreat in yeah. uh, in Santa Fe as I was embarking on a new journey with a divorce and uh and go back and think through so many for all of us john uh and this this concept that suicide can happen to everyone uh john you, you and i didn't get training that that suggested that no. uh and i think you and i both have resisted that a bit uh but uh uh what we've done is gone on this uh, uh this this journey together where we've realized the humanity of all this. And then life is a teacher itself, John, uh, for, for all of us. So Eduardo, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we didn't even get to lived expertise, uh, the impact that you've made on us, the, the magic of peer power, uh, the work that you continue to do at Humanovations and the work that, that, that you've done with you. Eduardo, say it again, the, the organization that you referenced. Uh, the Palliance Institute for Peer Support and Lived Expertise. Um, Terrific. So uh, join us again next week when uh, we'll have another pioneer in this space, Craig Miller, author of This Is How It Feels, uh, and one of the people in our in our documentary film. Uh, till then, uh, stay stay safe, stay supported. Every call, every life, every story matters. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. And join us again next time on Lifeline. Thank you.